and let us begin. Almighty God, through your Holy Spirit, you created unity in the midst of diversity. We acknowledge that human diversity is an expression of your manifold love for your creation. But we also confess that in our brokenness as human beings, we turn diversity into a source of alienation, injustice, oppression, and wounding. Empower us to recognize and celebrate differences as your great gift to the human family. Help us to see all peoples with your eyes of love and compassion, despite our limitations in accepting others. Enable us to be the architects of understanding, of respect and love, to be builders of bridges and not walls, to open doors and windows of new ways of welcoming our sisters and brothers. Through the Lord, the ground of all unity, the creator of the human family, we pray. Amen. Welcome, Father Joaquin. Um, Father Joaquin Andrade works for the Conference of Religious uh, in Brazil, and also, as you are seeing today, internationally. Uh, we are very uh, grateful for the time that he is taking. He originally is from India and uh, lives in Brazil approximately, I think, 30 years, right? Uh, Father uh, is one of the order of the Verbitas and, uh, and then uh, he um, study here in Chicago, in the United States. And then he uh, really, I had the opportunity many years ago, I think it was 2018, uh, to have Father Joaquin for our province in Brazil for initial formation people, to really go through the, what it means to be intercultural communities and how we can welcome each other. So Father Joaquin, I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you are busy too. And uh, so if you wanted to complete, I will be happy if you, if you have more to say to the sisters. So good morning. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, in fact, it is a joy. Uh, to be with you, mostly Franciscans. Sister Marie Lisa, I know her congregation as well. Smith sisters I have been working also last uh, two or three years here in Brazil. I also got to know them. Claudia is here, Sylvia is here, Giselle. So other sisters I do not know personally. <clears throat> I belong to the Society of the Divine Word. I think SVDs, you might be knowing. We are in Chicago and all over the states. We have uh, three or four provinces there. And here also in Brazil, we have four, three provinces. So I have been working in the southern part of uh, Brazil, a city called Curitiba pretty cold today. And we are also in bad shape with the coronavirus. I think seems to be locked down in my city. It is about uh, 2 million inhabitants. Okay, thanks a lot, Sister Marily. I hope you will get accustomed with my accent. <laughs> you... It is an intercultural problem. <laughs> you have to solve anyway. Uh, I shall try to speak slowly. If there is any doubt and all, I shall give some time. I have built up in two sessions. First session would be 
mostly uh, information about the interculturality as well as racism and different concepts which have been built in. Second one would be directly linked with the religious life, how we have to give some tips to have an intercultural living. So, uh, first I shall map the reality. Today's context holds a mirror to religious life. External elements like COVID-19, death of George Floyd, and here in Brazil, death of João Alberto Silveira Freitas, directly linked with the racial context and worldwide migration. So we have uh, COVID. I can't breathe. Floyd, as well as João Alberto said, and the migration or immigration, which take place. And there is an internal which holds a mirror also to the religious life. All the congregations today are intercultural. Increased multicultural nature of religious lives. De-Westernization of consecrated life. For example, my congregation is a totally Asian today. Membership from new cultures due to this flow of religious dwindling financial resources, which is also a big headache today, challenging experiences within the communities, community living, how we experience the other. Therefore, today we live in a shrinking world, everybody is closer to me. Nobody is so distant. Because of this, we find a paradigm shift. Because the religious, one who doesn't move, ceases to be a religious. Religious has to be always on the move. So, it is a fundamental characteristics of religious life. And due to this movement, we find several shifts, religious, cultural, ethnic, and geographical, which leads us to change in the methods of evangelization, missionary methods, living methods. And uh, there is no other way during the move or this movement, we change, congregation changes, our attitudes, our perceptions all change. But then same references, Jesus, the charism, living in different worlds, in the same community, different cultures we experience. And with this, we have movement from mutual and multi-directional. This is a challenge, challenge of today. And that what leads us to interculturality. So when we speak of multiculturalism or interculturality, three aspects are to be taken into account. I shall take a general idea of migrants. See the when the persons come to our congregation from different countries, different cultures, 
it is a as well as in the society huh? the personal characteristics of immigrants or the candidates come to our congregation the general characteristics of the host country and the people's attitudes towards the country's institutions in relation to socio economic security many people migrate looking for their own security different types of security primarily financial security this will lead us to know the characteristics of migrants know why the person has come how are the general conditions of that person someone always with a certain real needs nobody migrates just to for the migration say they have some real needs we no, need to know the real needs try to know the universe of the immigrant the social background family background religious background and cultural background so this applies those who look for to enter into our own congregations then what do the natives the receiving end the natives they have got their own theories individual theories emphasis on the qualification of the immigrant well qualified or not theory of human capital the employment situation how is the employer how about his situation in terms of financial security theory of cultural marginality cultural conflicts some of the countries or some of the cultures have the difficulties to understand the immigrants or those who have come to our congregation theory of social integration feeling safe in relation to the other collective economic theories if the host country has got high number of unemployment then the attitudes begin begin to change towards the immigrants so these are all the problems we have to deal with the external problems suddenly they peep in in our congregation as well in the religious life as well so therefore the integration process would be the two things two aspects we should know the structures at different levels of society that can hinder or facilitate integration so if the structures of the congregation how they are made up and accordingly some structures may hinder other structure can facilitate the absence of uh, inter ethnic contacts in the different arenas sometimes a neighborhood or one person did not have any experience with the person living experience with the other culture sister or religious then get into some problem to understand the other therefore how to empirically investigate the new perspectives on the integration process successful being translated into practice true integration and not the politics of process so this is the 
the two idea we have to get into for example my my congregation is mostly asian african so the original idea which the congregation had is a dwindling and we are reshaping with our own meetings context dialogue reflections so this movement the immigration or migration movement brings us to think about the culture multiculture different cultures living together which brought for example there are several definitions of culture classical culture modern culture contemporary culture so we shall uh, i shall uh, just uh, present here the tyler edward tyler he brought uh, first in his book primitive culture definition of culture as culture or civilization is a whole complex comprising knowledge belief art morals law customs and any other abilities and habits acquired by the human beings as a memory of a society this is roughly a classical definition and there is also a definition by the father agenor brigench one brazilian theologian he presents style culture as style or program of common life of a people or a social group taking in its external complexity and its inner unity composed of symbols and meanings political religious imaginary of the social organization material and spiritual work so we can define different ways but then to talk about uh, interculturality we need to know the culture as well and uh, there is a kind of uh, friction in our understanding sometimes personality and culture there are two people from brazil living in the states but then they are brazilians but then their personality is different so the upbringing the family traits all these things bring about some changes including in the congregation so we need to know uh, some of the personality when they move around from one place to the other how they behave some people with the personality traits other people with the cultural traits sometimes we say indians are like that but not all the indians so there here there is a small video i uh, i don't think so i can open it but then when i uh, send it for you uh, how to open this no it is the africans uh, how they get into the planes uh, aeroplane to move to a other country and their experience they share i think uh, when i send it to you you can open with your own computer without any problem so there is a question of a personality and culture as people are varying culture how are we different how are we alike this is the question comes through how do culture shape our identities and personalities the two things are go hand in hand then what is the interplay between culture and personality is there any tension between the two so here in brazil for example our svd missionaries indians around 30 of us 30 each one is from different 
uh, state in India, when we come together, we present ourselves as Indians, but then the Brazilians note the differences among us. This is where what I call personality and cultural differences in the congregation as well. We experience this. Therefore, the leadership team should know where they come from, how do they behave, and why those two people from the same culture, same country, they are behave different or their personality is different. Are we not often caught up between the tendencies of stereotyping on the basis of culture and that of being our individual difference? Sometimes we have got uh, uh, prejudices. We say our oh, Indians are like that or Brazilians are like that, but need not be. So there are some differences, personality differences. This will take me to reflect on interculturality. It is a sustained interaction of the members or people raised in different cultural backgrounds. It denotes mutual exchange between cultures that can lead to transformation and enriching, enrichment of all those who are involved in the community. Contract with the multiculturality, the social condition of people who differ in culture and language, yet live more by chance than by choice in close proximity with one another. So this is the, the movement we find. The interculturality is a topic very much discussed today. And uh, people move from one place to the other. We get to know them so well. So by the fact that we get to know them so well, and suddenly after a certain stage, we begin to know more deeper certain aspects which are totally different from my culture, then we get into problems of kind of uh, racism. So what is racism? It is a discrimination proceed from prejudice and a depraved sentiment. It looks that they have got their source in the defect of the mind as much as in the vices of the heart. I think once we do not have a clear comprehension or the affective being not able to relate, then this is where the racism kicks in. Sometimes the jealousy, other elements too. The defects and vices lie in the attempts to craft a world where one can stand above the fray. So we are always better than the other. You see. So this is racism and discrimination result in dismissiveness and a lack of concern for the other. Evocative of Cain's response. Am I my brother's keeper. So each one for himself, God is for everyone. This was the deal with Cain, with his own brother, Abel. But then here, what happens? Our Pope Francis has got a different idea. Racism comes in when we are incapable to see God is of everyone. God as universal. I think is uh, for everyone. 
by the fact that he is my God, like he, uh, Old Testament. Old Testament, there is a constant friction between inclusion and in exclusion. Till Exodus, we find the Pentateuch, they were living together with the Egyptians, with other cultures. Abraham had his wife from Agar, Egyptian. Joseph had his wife, one Pharaoh's daughter. But then when they come to the Israel, through the Exodus process, in the beginning, they were able to relate well. But then in the later stages, they were not at all able to include the other. Those who are belonging to the alliance, covenant, they are protected by God, only they belong to a group. Others are outsiders. This attitude was not there in the earlier stages of the Old Testament. And precisely, Jesus brings about a new thought. He begins a different attitude in his approach. There is a Samaritan woman. There is a good Samaritan. Roman centurion. They are also good people. So it is not those who belong to the covenant are just saved. Other people are also saved. They are also good people. I think this is a drastic change which has happened in the biblical world, then Judaism world, then the world of Jesus and Paul. Paul also brings about, he was born in Tarshish, modern Turkey, goes to Jerusalem, he becomes more with the Judaic tendencies, then he moves, slowly opening himself to the world. So it, it is a conversion takes place, which I talked about, I shall talk about later on. Uh, this is where the prophetic call of uh, Pope Francis, the prophetic call to action embodies an understanding of salvation, salvation eschatology assumed with Pope Francis, understanding of the promotion of justice, peace, and integrity of creation. Yes. You are your brother's keeper. To be human means to care for one another. You see, the things suddenly change. I am responsible to my brother, to my sister in my community. Several theories have come up of late, assimilation, Multiculturalism, problem of parallel cultures living together, interculturalism, mutual assimilation in some areas while maintaining cultural patterns of distinctiveness, which happens in the society as well. But in the religious life or in the church, there is a missiological theory, the transplantation of the cultures, probably in the earlier stages, before Vatican II, we used to transplant the European culture to the other places, other continent. Because the understanding was European society was a perfect society, we should implant this perfect society in other places. That's what uh, the method, 
clerical method or ecclesial method was implanted in other countries, which we have experienced here in, uh, here in Brazil or Latin America as well. Then later on, it came about inter inculturation with the Vatican II because the European countries lost their own, uh, uh, what you call the countries, colonized countries. So need to invent a new method of inculturation, inculturating our message in that culture. And interculturation, it is a new uh, way of thinking. Now the other is not in a distant place, is closer to me because of the migration process. So this theory, the mutual exchange and enrichment of religious beliefs and practices through the interaction of various cultures in the same group, same region, same society or same congregation. This is where we get into problems. Problems in the sense, some cultures individualistic, other cultures collective. Supposing if you ask me today, how about Indian culture? Indian culture, as far as my studies go, we are a collective mind. There is no individual as such. Who controls parents or society as well? We become individuals in the Indian context, Hinduism, other strata, when we go in search of the absolute. When you search God, I abandon the family roots and look all alone. It is an individual search. Whereas in the West, we have also this paradigm. Uh, Saint Benedict, he brought the idea of religious life to Europe and he makes a shift uh, from uh, individual search to the collective community search and we look for in a community way, collective way, when we look for the spiritual experience, mystical experience. But in our day-to-day -day living, we are individualistic. Individualism, I make my life. Whereas in the Eastern countries, you know, the group makes its life. So when one person of this culture enters into the congregation, then there are several mechanisms to enter. And the, both the sides should change. Those who accept, or the congregation is accept the person and the person as well has to enter. This is where generalization in US and China or individualism or collectivism. This I gave the example of India. It is a, most of the Latin American countries as well. The touch with the family, family bonds are very strong. So this is sometimes makes difficult to change move from one culture to the other. And this is where we are called, my dear sisters, most of you are Franciscan sisters. Diversity is divine. So we are called to give our hands to proclaim. Hands here, ethnically, Culturally and religious. It's the interreligious dialogue, ecumenism, whatever you may say. We have to give our hand. Probably the church is the best place to elaborate this idea. Giving hands to work together. Diversity is divine. And which brings about today. Is a different generation. You see, we never lived 
so many generations together like this. Six generations here, we have the great generation born between 1901 to 1926. Uh, Great Economic Depression, which is later on, 29, which started. Sacrifice, First World War. Then we have mature generation. That is some of the sisters who are who were born in this time. This period still are there. Oh, but then they can reflect, they can think. There is a mature generation, which is silent, born between 20, seven to 45 during the Second World War, participation in the civil rights, protests against the war, all these things at that time, societies were growing in terms of uh, uh, globalization or developments were taking place. Generation of generating children, born between 46 and 64, agricultural society. We need many people to work in the field, the farms, need to have many children. Mothers were controlling the family, telling the children, my son, my daughter, you have to go to the city because here you will suffer. So there was a flow to the big cities from the villages. Then in the cities, generation X, born between 65 to 80, it means man and woman, or male or female in the cities, growing together. Both of them have to work, to earn, to maintain the family. Both are independent. Therefore, high rate of divorce, children suffer. They are in the, the institutions with the sisters taking care of the children, all this. No attachment to one partner, nor to their job. They shift to their job. Thus, they are also not interested much with the church activities. Fifth generation, millennium, it's Y generation, 1981 to 2000, internet, computers mobile phones, team-oriented, optimistic, though they are having the difficulties with the jobs, jobless generation. And generation Z, boom, born after 2001, they are uh, uh, adolescents or young generation, early 18, 19, 20, about. They do not know how the future would be. So this is where the, our pandemic situation brought a different attitude altogether. Many dreams have gone. Many youth have lost one year, two years, especially in other countries in the East or in Brazil as well. I teach in the university. I feel the uh, depression. Other problems have kicked in in this generation because they have lost one or two years. It means at this age, losing one or two years, it makes a lot of difference, including the church as well. Uh, sisters, we will have a different type of religious life. We, are, we have to change. Monoculture will never be there from now on in the congregations. So this living six generations together brings about some problems and there are some solutions too. And uh, we also not clear how will be the church situation. On the one side, there is a group in the church, ultra conservative. They want to go back to the olden times. And so conservative, 
they don't want any change. They fall back to the, the ritual, liturgy, everything should be trained, elaborated by trained, Council of Trained. Whereas Vatican II or Pope Francis, his proposals are not that welcomed. So this is where two old and new living together. Okay, some concepts. This is where the, uh, the final slide, last slide I would like to put in. When the people move or enter into the congregation, we have to think how the person has got the socialization in his own or in her own culture. First one. If there is a, not a good socialization, if the person has not learned or adapted to his own culture, then get into problems entering into a congregation and living with the other members. So first we have to socialization means learning my culture. Acculturation means learning or adapting myself to the other culture but not with many responsibilities as such. For example, <clears throat> I go to the States, learn some, one or two years I stay there, I know that I would come back to Brazil, so I will do certain type of adaptation just for one or two years. Whereas inculturation has got a more responsibility. I go as a missionary, stay there, but I'm not an executive. By the fact that I am a missionary, I mean, working in a parish in the state, I have the concern to the people, to the families. What do they go through? I get in into their shoes. In the acculturation process, I need not go so deep as it is an inculturation. Acculturation, we can call it anthropologist who remains neutral. Inculturation is a missionary or religious get into the problems as well. Transculturation is a perception. We see different cultures moving in the society. Multiculturation is a recognition that several cultures are together, living together. Interculturation, it means ad intra. I have to live my life in the congregation with the other elaborating, who is not in a faraway place, but then he's closer. And today, the communication process, the technique, uh, new techniques, brings us together. Virtually, we are linked together today in this uh, uh, session. And interculturality is nothing but we live under one roof, sharing the same meal, same space, with the one objective of the charism for which I have entered into. And from this charism, we maintain our differences, but work together to enrich the context where we work in. So this is where the thing comes in. Our, we did the process going through different ideas to treat in the congregation how the interculturality should be. This is what I will talk in the second session. Maybe comments or questions to transplantation. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, unmute your um, <clears throat> mic. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, when I think of religious life, it is a culture of its own. And it's a culture that has morphed over time from um, 
I'm from the uh, mature generation. Okay. So I have um, experienced change in an evolution in religious life. So when we live in an intercultural community, do we little by little learn of each other's cultures and kind of place that into the ebb and flow of community life? Is it better to, in other words, it, it almost seems as if there has to be an evolution of something new when you have different cultures living in the same community. Does that make sense, my question? Yeah, it makes sense. <clears throat> uh, how shall I put it? A sister, when we relate to someone, we change. You can call it as a evolution process in your attitude or your perception begins to change of the other. And uh, it is a constant conversion which takes place within you. But uh, it also depends how the uh, uh, nature of relationship with, you, with which you enter into contact with the other. <clears throat> Probably the second session, I shall treat some of the aspects, how we begin to change. Probably MBI method, the Stefano as well as Majnevsky, they offer <clears throat> little by little we transcend. For example, when you have your transfer from one place to the other, you there is a lot of transition taking place in you. Sometimes it is not evident for you, others see. And as we grow, for example, today, one of my students was doing his uh, degree. I was this guy. He died today of COVID this morning. So what happens? We change. He's a Brazilian, I'm an Indian. So the relationship with which we build up our relationship, <clears throat> the table, other places, may not be living experience. But, so this is where the, uh, as per our age, as per our situation, we get into. Probably the second session make it uh, some things will, will make clear to you. Um, probably I need not tell at the moment, but then you have the reason. This is where we, we change. I, I just want to make a, a comment. Um, I'll lower my hand. I, I'm, I'm currently reading um, a small book. It's called, But I'm Not a Racist by a Kathy O'Bear. Um, we had heard of this book on another Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting, she's talking a lot about, especially in our US culture, our white supremacy and our attitudes of privilege. And she really brings out the problem, the difficulty is that those of us brought up in the US who are white do not realize that we have a culture and that not everybody fits into our culture. And that's where we get into the that, us and them. So there has to be a growth and an awareness of the culture that we have been raised and how certain lenses or filters have been given to us. And we have to learn what triggers the, those ideas that separate us and we make distinctions and see ourselves as superior from others. So I just wanna put that out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, <clears throat> just to add to that, your idea, uh, 
if you see the history of our humanity, the color, black color was never been seen in a right perspective all through. In our mindset as such, white is superior to black. Mm -hmm. So this is where the, the, the idea which has humanity has developed. For example, we have one Manuela who, uh, she did one uh, study here. Most of our uh, football players in Brazil, they come from the periphery background. They have got African background then normally what happens, there is a money flow and the weddings, they get, get married to the white, uh, white girls. Then what happens, it is a psychological thing. The player, man, who is a black man, he thinks by marrying one white woman, I raise my status. It is unconscious, unconscious. Whereas the white woman who married to a black man, she thinks if I were to marry a white man, I will be submissive at home. But marrying with a black man, I can dominate, you see? These ideas are uh, what we call inner ideas, psychological thing. But then we have to come to a stage. We have to come to a stage, especially in the religious life. Is it true? Most of the time, these marriages don't work, get on all well. Seldom. If one white man gets married to a black woman, most of the time it goes well. There are no all these. Uh, what you call, uh, what humanity built on. Uh, these things are probably do not keep in. Then what you said is uh, right. Uh, this is just, I'm also uh, putting across some idea, one of the authors from uh, anthropologists from Brazil. For example, Indians, Indians normally they don't get married to the other culture, very seldom. Africa, for example, whole of commerce is a, in the hands of uh, Indians. But then when they get married, they go to India, bring one wife, come back, they never get, very seldom, you see. So they are, uh, most of them are, most of us are racist in that way. Whereas white people, in that way, they have no difficulty as, as such to relate with someone. Whereas Indian culture, as far as I see, we have got the difficulties because Africa is an example for it. Interculturality in the religious life. See, today, the era of accelerating globalization, interculturality has become one of the most discussed topics, factors, I told you, migration, post-modernity, technological advancement, explosion of social media, and religious congregation. Most of us are from uh, American origin or European origin, spread rather rapidly and far beyond their historical origins recruiting from many cultures over time for their membership. So this is the first point, paradigm shift. We are recruiting members from the other cultures. So this is what we call a uh, reverse flow. The former paradigm was a Eurocentric mission Whereas today's paradigm is intercultural paradigm, reverse flow, flow of missionaries from 
Asia, Africa, Latin American continent began to irrigate, irrigate the rest of the planet. You see, this is where fits in. Therefore, the thing of interculturality fits in. There was in 1990 in Ireland, Roscommon consensus where the European bishop, European congregations uh, came to a conclusion saying, Europe is a mission land, mission country. The process of re-evangelization. Therefore, those Europeans who evangelized Indians or Latin Americans or Indonesians or Africans, they went to Europe for the mission in the parishes, to work in the parishes. So this is what we call a reverse flow or intercultural paradise. This takes us to think on the today several books have been published sobre, about the intelligence intellectual intelligence which we get in the schools emotional intelligence at home relating with our own home members artificial intelligence with the new technology cultural intelligence in the society uh, where we live in in the community where we live in an intercultural intelligence. This is where we find our congregations, religious lives, or church as well, religious order, religious congregation, where we find intercultural intelligence where we have to build up. So therefore, here I shall uh, go through some historical mapping of uh, religious life and some theories which have come up how to deal with the uh, interculturality, new trends, and some of the shadows of interculturality in the congregation and some pathways in which way we can find new ways for a good intercultural living. You know, historical books, any congregation, its origin is charismatic. The founder has no much idea, but then founder has the vision. So it's charismatic, God experience, and the small group around the founder, and they work. The congregation expands. 30, 40, 50 years, so many members get into, get in. And it expands in such a way, the charism spread, spreading out, then comes accommodation. Some members, ah, many are, we are so many, therefore leave the things for the other to work. So around 20%, something like that, get into uh, relaxed life, accommodation, then the congregation gets into crisis. So this is the flow. Huh? They say between 150 to 200 years of uh, origin of that congregation, foundation of the congregation, get into problems, crisis, numerical crisis and other crises. So the original charism is questioned, the same group as a created creed, conviction, identity, charism, expanded with the numerical growth, now crisis. Ideological doubts, question of faith, ethical doubts, question of fidelity, structural doubts, question of new blood. You have to get the new members. 
So, when the number is less, we have to look for. So, like uh, Latin America, in my congregation, we are about 350 members, but the local ones, Brazilians, around 80, rest all are from abroad. So, this importation has been taking place because in Asia we have so many. So, this uh, way of uh, working, taking the missionaries from one continent to the other, this flow brings about lot many changes, paradigm shifts. Normally, when the congregation gets into crisis, experience experiences desperation, therefore, whole congregation starts working. Exaggerated activism, individuals are working, structural activism, whole province, whole congregation enters into activism, then balance between being and doing is lost. Vision of the gospel is lost. Individual projects get in. So it is a difficult to connect individual charism with the congregation charism. You know, it was the individual search. Fathers and mothers of the desert They used to move from the big cities like Alexandria, Antioquia. They are all commercial cities on those years. So there was a lot of uh, spiritual orientation and all. Then people used to talk to the fathers, to the mothers. But then to have a real orientation, mystical experience, religious experience, they used to move for, for a week or 15 days, 15 kilometers away from the bigger city into the desert. They used to stay doing the experience of God. But then people were impatient. They wanted to know, I would like to talk to that father. So people started moving into the desert and then they started building the monasteries, convents in the desert. So normally our religious convents or seminaries, earlier times, they were almost uh, 10 to 15 kilometers away from the city. Of course, today cities have gone up to there. Invaded. But then the idea was a uh, little bit away from the cities centered into the urban context, re-foundation of religious life. Therefore, today what happens, crisis of model, this model has been passing through certain crises, crisis of individuals, because very few people, and crisis of structures. This model, geographical model, that everything used to come from Europe, Eurocentrism, everything used to go, but this has been changed into dialogical model. This model of mission, where we have to give our hands in different ways for the mission. This leads some of the theories of intercultural sensibility. What happens when one person enters into a congregation, person from different culture? This Milton Bennett, he said about ethnocentrism to ethno-relativism. One movement, while experiencing the difference, you pass through six stages. Denial, 
डिफेंस मिनिमाइजेशन एक्सेप्टेंस एडेप्टेशन इंटरग्रेशन सो सिस्टर्स इज समवन एंटर्स इनटू द कांग्रेगेशन ऑफ द अदर कल्चर द फर्स्ट स्टेज पर्सन फील्स आह आई एम नॉट एबल टू adapt myself to this congregation to this way of life i would like to remain separate from the bigger group maybe 15 to 20 days one month this idea goes through the person inside the person then slowly starts anyway i have no other choice other than to relate sometimes to to the members but then i shall maintain my culture so this is a a kind of defense mechanism three months or four months have gone the person suddenly begins to understand with the other the person of the other culture the host culture someone call come today we shall have a cup of or a cup of tea or one glass of beer then the person changes my god in my culture also we give the hospitality in this way this person also give me it means my culture and this host culture have got some similarities the so minimization then one day the member of the host culture told the person we shall go today out to have a meal in a restaurant then the person is slowly opening himself or herself to the host culture i think here also there are good people this culture also have got good elements as i experience in my culture then slowly begin to open himself or herself to the new culture then try to adapt to the real situation of the host culture consciously so far maintaining distance now people have accepted me 8 months or 9 months or 1 year has gone they have said i have got good friends in the host culture now so in that way the person who entered get into a uh, integration integrated depends on the culture depends on the socialization of the individual it may take one year two years three years depends so the leadership or provincial or general or formator should know how the person is making this progress sometimes a person may not do this go through these stages one resistant may be acute resistant may not get into the whole system of the congregation so this is where the formators have to see the intercultural sensibility and formator also should know at least something about the culture where the person comes from d stefan and masnevsky they have got mbi theory it means mapping bridging integrating one person one individual when enters with the intercultural community first thing does the mapping more rational who am i and who is the other you see color or idea everything is different starts thinking at the first stage then after a while bridging 
phenomenal perceptional perception grows in why I am different. Why is the other different? Starts questioning all the stages. This is where a little bit after living one or two or three months or four months. Once it is done, then integrating more of the heart. I accept the differences and I understand the other. I think this, is, this process is an excellent process once the formators are able to do with the candidates or the sisters, those who get in. And uh, we have to go through. This is an experience of transition, which I was telling, but slowly blows away, rose. And these three uh, process, probably perhaps is the best one uh, to get to know and get inside one culture, which is different that of mine. There is missiological theory. Three ways. First stage would be learn to take off shoes. Cultural shoes. For example, I have my shoes, Indian shoes. In the, normally it is very hot, we use only slipper. Learn to know how to leave and how to enter. It means I should be able to take off my shoes and get on the shoes of the culture where I get in. The whole mentality which I have with that. Because my way of seeing, being, learning, praying, everything is Indian. I have to take these shoes and get him to know or wear the shoes of Brazil. Second would be learn to be a guest. I think every religious is a guest. We are learning to adjust between the old and new culture. The culture which I have left behind and the culture in which I'm getting in. I think this is where the relationship between uh, one who comes and one who receives. I think once there is a uh, the relationship well established between these two. This is the starting point that a congregation will go forward. These are just sometimes here only comes the point of racism, ethnical differences, prejudices. We try to build here at this point. This is where we have to learn, uh, adjust between my culture and new culture, one who gets into the congregation. Third would be, learn to enter the garden. Uh, it is a cultural garden. Learn to discern. Garden, whatever it is, flower garden, for example. Uh, we have to work. Some of the weeds come in, we have to pick up and throw the weeds. This is where point comes saying, how do I know these weeds I have to plant? Garden is a garden everywhere. But then the mentalities are different. Once you are in, let's say, three or four months, had done the adjustment between the old culture and new culture, you are able to discern from the perspective of new culture and see what is good, what is bad, discern in the new culture. I think one, you can become the provincial, you can become the general once the host culture 
recognizes that the person from the other culture has already adapted, learned everything, then the host culture thinks we can name this person as a provincial or general, I accept it. So this is the process, evolutionary process of interculturality. I think we have most of the congregation, we have the generals or provincials, not from the host country. My uh, congregation is a German, but now we have a flag. Several superior generals are from Asia. One was uh, from Philippines, now is an Indonesian, like this. Here also we have several examples of that sort. So this is where the maturity of the congregation is shown. How do I this? Having awareness of myself, my being, finding meaning in my life, my choice. Articulate, by articulating my experience of God. New perceptions and love for the mission. Mission in the sense, the charism, which uh, my congregation has brought. Through that, I build up this. Some of the new trends, sisters, you see, we have moved. The talk was, earlier times, international congregations. 1900 to 1965, maybe till Vatican II. Then from there it was a movement. The congregations or religious life was seen as multicultural. Because many people or members from different cultures till 1994, then the new idea was brought in. Congregations are intercultural. Multicultural, still host culture had the hold. While intercultural, hold, host culture may not have that hold because the other culture members have learned all the dynamics of the congregation and they are able to take us the congregation, lead the congregation. So this is a new trend has come in the last few years or two decades, three decades, something like that, which brings about a new models. Augusto Frank, one Brazilian, he said, see, centralized model, decentralized model, distributed model. Centralized model means here, superior general has the control. The general council thinks everything should work out in this way. This group is thinking, thinking group. But then later on, 65 to 2000, something like that, we have Still today, we have the central point here only. But then the responsibilities are given to the local level, distributed, decentralized. But then the general aid has the control, control in the sense, well distributed, taken care of the whole congregation. At present what happens to the new generation. We have web network model. Though the point is here, there is no superior, no inferior. Everybody is equal. The communications are very, very quick. 
and our world is moving towards this direction web model but then we cannot say which is superior which is inferior all of them have got their own shadows and drawbacks but then richness but then the tendency is which the world is moving today for this model but then how we do how we deal with it so this is the new trend some of the shadows of interculturality shadows of diversity a soothing soothing tongue is a tree of life but a perverse one crushes the spirit which means what you see the language spoken today is a chinese almost 1 billion then comes about english it may roughly change a bit the statistics hindi indian spanish russian other other languages or arabic or portuguese uh, all the other other languages coming and this brings about some of the consequences in the congregation you see hegemony of the language which was the first language of the congregation mine is a german but then german members are very few today we deal with the english and spanish and indonesian it means the original language or first language of the congregation versus language of the majority and the diversity of the language spoken in an international congregation you see sisters what happens if the english is a dominant language in the congregation one member from africa or from india lack of fluency in a language can lead to a person being ignored one person from the other culture is not able to express well his ideas in a right way in the language of the majority his or her ideas are discarded this is a shadow the leadership team should think what to do is it the person is able to express his or ideas clearly in the right way whose voice is heard in intercultural gathering and in writing written documents you see so the original language in which our constitution whole baggage which we have received from the founders and all is no more the congregations have chosen the language of the majority the language of the majority who is able to express ideas fluency in the language and other who lacks is totally ignored so therefore part ways to interculturality we should think in terms of three principles contextuality framework where meaning and significance can be determined for one's behavior and action multiple perspectives equally rational persons can look at the same issue but may understand it differently authentic participation affirms the equal rights of all participants which is uh, it is not that easy though we think it is easy but then we have to put into practice these ideas nishizaka one japanese author explains 
when one uses categories like East and West, Japanese or foreigner, or whatever as the starting and end point of analysis, as is usual in the case of intercultural communication studies, the result is not only to hinder the human encounter, but to hamper the very interculturality of intercultural communication from being investigated in its own right. It means we already, so he brings about a new idea, human person, not East and West or native or foreigner, Japanese or Indian. So this is where we bring about one idea which is system Judati Galaris. She also builds up some ideas are interesting. Theological and formative process that facilitates encounter, which is a formation and formative process. Every congregation has to pick up. In terms of identity, personal and institutional, we have to build up. And also the experience of conversion in encountering the other. Every time when we meet other, we change. Encountering the other and the stranger within me. The other is a stranger within me. Encountering God, the holy other. It means these are all reflections, spiritual reflections. Sister brings up, I cannot, uh, what you call, uh, deepen it much, but then we should be aware of it. So therefore, the pathways of interculturality would be focus on intercultural formation. Exit learning, entry learning. Both happen all through religious life from both the sides. It means the host culture also has to have exit learning and entry learning. As the person comes from outside also does the same process. So once it happens, uh, exit learning, entry learning from both the sides, we get into. There is a spiritual basic framework, the foundations, our uh, trinity, the relationship between God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, community, the mission, Trinity, this is where intrapersonal growing wholeness and self-integration, interpersonal relationship and sense of belonging. So it is a gospel life value system, attitude option lifestyle. Transpersonal witness, commitment, mission, service, Cosmic personal connectedness with the universe community. You see, we are slowly getting out from our ghetto mentality to the universal cosmic mentality. The best place for this is a table. This is what I said. Uh, Jesus moves from the Judaic mentality to the fellowship. I think uh, Indian Hinduism stresses on vision. Judaism stresses on audition, hearing, listening. That Christian tradition is a fellowship. I think we are able to sit with anyone on the table without any difficulty. I think the intercultural, not just eating together, making food, but then we are coming together 
sharing, being different, sharing the same food, table fellowship. I think religious congregations is the best example for me. This is where we also feel intercultural challenge of a vowed life. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. I think here we have to build up new insights of the vowed life emerging. We, together within an I perspective, I am joking. In the former days, I had no identity. It was a SVD identity. Today, I am joking a personal identity in the congregation. Difficulties in allowing new paradigm to emerge. We hold on to old system. Communal living of the vows, a prophetic witness today. Living together, the prophetic witness. So how do we understand poverty, chastity, and obedience? Personal and social dimension of the vow of poverty. See, poverty doesn't make any sense. When I am poor, I have nothing to eat at home as a child. Now I am in a congregation. I have to make a vow of poverty. Because I have nothing. I had nothing. Does it make any sense making vow of poverty? I had nothing. So what happens here? It makes sense in the sense that we have to context and cultures call for a reinterpretation of the vow. Reinterpret. Lifelong commitment to the personal relationships with God and the availability to promote God's reign. It is a chastity. Different cultural understanding of life Fecundity and fruitfulness. Some of the cultures, fecundity is very important. How do we understand? Pre-Vatican hierarchical structure within the congregations. Participative model, which emphasizes on collegiality, mutuality, which is the obedience. So the leadership can lead the reflection to live the vows in credible ways. So what is the uh, task of the leadership team? What do you have to do? What we have to do? For example, personal transformation. Learn the language of the culture and dynamics of the culture. Becoming culturally competent, lead deeper conversations, what needs to live an intercultural community, the meaning of the vows today in the multicultural world, purpose that is worth, that is the rest of your life, motivate members to live gospel values and attitudes that needed today in a multicultural world, create intentional prophetical communities. So these are all the uh, tasks. So I wind up my second session giving three spirituality of secrets. Listen to the voice of conscience. Listen to the voice of tradition. Listen to the voice of the reality around. I think uh, this is the basic point. Each one. Conscience means relationships. When my physical body seeks the relations, it is sexuality. When my mind seeks the relations, companionship. When my emotions seek relations, love. My whole being seeks a relation, a communion. I think we have to grow 
listening to our own conscience in this way. Listening to the tradition means what the church has taught, what my congregation has taught, seeing that I am a person created by God in the image of God. Once I recognize that I am an image of God, I see the other as a manifestation of God. So once I know other one, other is a manifestation, then I have no right to discriminate or racism. I'm just being compassionate, welcoming, hospitable to the other. And seeing and the listening to the reality means new models of spirituality, new forms of formation, listening. For example, olden days, our formators used to say and we used to obey. But then today, formators also should listen to the formandees because they have a lot of information. They are digitals. And we are migrants, digitals. We did not learn. But then the child, children, adolescents, they are champions in the new technology. So we listen to them because they have got more information. And but then we also teach them because we have got experience and knowledge. So these three uh, moments, listening to the conscience, listening to the tradition, listening to the reality around our new generation makes us more intercultural. It was a quick exposition. It is not that easy to put across the ideas within two hours. Uh, I was uh, trying to summarize, and but then putting also some of the important elements in order that we have a rough idea of interculturality and intercultural living. There are a few minutes we have. I have left some questions also. If need be, I shall send it to Marie Lisa. She can uh, distribute later on. Now we shall keep it open. If there is any idea, one question, or one doubt, one clarification, or anything to add up, we can keep the space open. I, I believe this second session, you gave a lot to think about, uh, especially when we are engaged with um, vocations and, you know, new perspectives or people in initial formation uh, from different countries. So not only, you know, one, and how, how to facilitate that connection and this listening. <laughs> I, I think the secret that you are giving uh, in those three things, you know, uh, three ways of listening uh, for me, they are the key of uh, our relationships and also to understand why the other one is different than myself and is acting different and not only <laughs> is thinking different, that's why he's acting different and is coming from a very different uh, environment and the whole thing here, I, I'm not sure, I don't want to take your time, but I, I think initial formation has been um, a challenge just because it's um, challenging us to change, each one of us. If we don't change, 
how can we help in this uh, intercultural relationships and coming together? So I think that, and that's for our lives too, from uh, sisters from different countries or different background. And um, in the same country, we have differences. <laughs> it's not from one country to the other. But I, I really, I, I feel like, I don't know if you feel the same, but I feel like I needed to, to think more and to go through the slides and, you know, it, it, to go deep in what, in the message that you uh, just is leaving with us. I'm sorry we don't have too much time, but, you know, that's... Uh, that's it. What happened, uh, to give a rough idea, I mean, ultimately, sisters, uh, the spirituality line, formation line, if we are able to grow with the two movements, external and internal, this is what COVID has done. I think COVID has uh, blocked our uh, senses to the outer world and we have opened our uh, senses to the inner world. We are moving inside, internal. And this is where these three points perhaps put us in a track, spiritual track, listening to myself, my voice, conscience, the other, or tradition, what, what I have received from my congregation, from my church, father, some of the uh, grandfather, grandmother, they wish to tell something. I fall back to my roots. Then also I listen to the digital world. What these young children want to tell me today. So this is where, uh, besides uh, the formations, uh, there are different stages of formation because the time was very, uh, two hours you cannot. Uh, but then we can, uh, in terms of uh, retreat, intercultural retreat, intercultural formation, intercultural process of entering into the other culture, all these elements could be developed later on. You can also look for other ways, but then this is what is very important because religious life has changed and will change after this pandemic. Thank you, Father. 